We want to understand the great Indian credit boom of 2004 to 2008. I want to acknowledge that Josh is the person who in 2006 pointed out this phenomenon and in some sense it's been on our radar ever since. So uh, to place it in the setting, in recent years uh, we economists are a lot more conscious about credit booms. We think it's a big deal, we think it's an important issue. Uh, there is much more of attention to credit booms in the research literature than was the case uh, a scant uh, 10 years ago. If I may summarize uh, around 10 papers in this field, uh, not all credit booms are bad, but almost all, perhaps 80% or 90% of financial crises are preceded by a significant credit boom. So that's a good way to motivate why we should take interest in uh, credit booms. And uh, there is a caricature out there, which I'm not saying is always correct, but some people see some credit booms as a time of euphoria, where everybody goes a little mad, where there is a contagious optimism in the air, and everybody feels good about the world. So entrepreneurs dream up crazy projects, banks think those crazy projects will actually work, and supervisors believe the risk models of the banks. So it all comes together. This is a period of extreme euphoria. This is one characterization of uh, credit booms. And it's, it's important to worry about uh, whether this is the way the world has worked out. Now, the bulk of the credit booms literature has come at it from two perspectives, either at the level of a country or at the level of banks. Uh, the country level literature typically looks at macroeconomic aggregates like credit to GDP, identifies credit boom periods, looks for episodes of financial crises in the aftermath, and so on. The banking literature looks at data at the level of individual banks, looks for evidence about uh, bank stress in banks in the aftermath of a credit boom. Now, let me uh, describe the story that we saw in India. This is a graph that goes back to 1990. It is the year-on-year -year growth of industrial credit by banks, a, a piece that I will make precise in a moment. And uh, the three blue lines are the median, the 25th, and the 75th percentiles. And you see four years just jump out at you, that 2004-5 to 2007-8, they simply jump out as years of very large credit growth compared with the remaining 25-year history. So there's really one outstanding credit boom in 25 years of the Indian history. Uh, the numbers in that period are roughly 30-35% of nominal credit growth. At the time, inflation was roughly 7 to 8%. So we're looking at real credit growth of perhaps 22, 23, 24% per year for four years. So that's the great Indian credit boom that uh, is worth analyzing and uh, uh, taking interest in. Now for definitions, what do we mean by industrial credit? Uh, we take the uh, industry, uh, we take the sectoral breakdown of bank credit that is available from uh, RBI, and we exclude individuals, agriculture, and the food corporation of India. We count everything else. That's a reasonable definition. So the previous graph, the great credit boom of 2004-05 to 2007-08 is about lending by banks to everybody other than individuals, agriculture, and uh, uh, the Food Corporation of India. As an aside, there was a very big credit boom to individuals also at the time, but the micro data that we're going to use doesn't cover that, so I just keep away from that question. Okay. <coughs> what was the macroeconomic context of this credit boom? I had uh, briefly touched upon it. Uh, Shang Jinwei invented a great uh, regression that all of us use when we study exchange rate regimes. And that uh, regression R squared was 0 0.97 from 1998 till 2004. And then the exchange rate regime became more flexible. It became 0 0.85 till uh, 16th of March 2007, after which it became far more flexible until 2013. So it is this exchange rate rigidity which got us into trouble. The, there were capital inflows coming into the country and uh, <coughs> this spilled over into monetary policy. So we got inappropriately low uh, interest rates. The paper that Radhika and Ila presented yesterday dates the business cycle expansion as Q1 2003 to Q2 2007, which you see fits squarely with these dates. And that's where monetary policy laid the foundation for the credit boom. And that's how we got here. 
Okay, uh, Gurnain emphasized that we should be paying attention to credit to GDP ratios and not just year on year uh, credit growth. I have mixed feelings about it because in a way the numbers here are violently large. 30% nominal credit growth for four years jumping out of the long term time series. Here is the credit GDP uh, ratio data. Now we have to see the context. Most people are shocked at the small values. This is 15% of GDP, this is 30% of GDP. Uh, in India, the banking system is small and uh, large parts of bank credit are uh, captured by the government and by uh, what is called priority sector lending, a lot of which includes uh, uh, agriculture. So actually the bank credit going to the mainstream uh, capitalism is relatively small. So you see a long period where it was hovering between 15 and 18% uh, of GDP and then in the boom period it goes up to 30% of GDP. So the magnitude of the boom in the industrial credit is 15 percentage points of GDP. Uh, there is no long run norm for what credit to GDP should be because this is a country where we're just about barely getting a banking system off the ground. So you would expect this to grow dramatically and you know this, this you really cannot say that there is a benchmark around which credit to GDP should normally be. Hence, it makes more sense to use the year-on-year -year growth rate to pluck out the four years of the credit boom. With a lag, the non-performing assets started showing up. What is shown here is the year-on-year -year growth of the non-performing assets, where we add the uh, official uh, disclosure about the non-performing assets, but we add in all the assets that were put into something called the CDR, the Corporate Debt Restructuring Mechanism of RBI. Uh, uh, some here will argue that is overly pessimistic, it's a subject of debate, but if you add up these two then this is the year on year growth. So you see by 2011 and 2012, you see pretty large increases, this is 80% uh, on a year on year basis of the bad assets. And this is again typical of what we know in banking all over the world that a credit surge is followed by a surge in bad assets with a lag. It also depends on the forbearance, on the extent to which the banks and the regulator like to hide bad news. So that differs from country to country. Now I want to highlight a, an industry story about the credit boom. Uh, so we start with 2004 and end at 2008, that's the period of the credit boom. <coughs> and we take the simple ratio of credit in 2008 divided by credit in 2004. We call that number B. We're going to use this definition many times uh, today. The two industries where the strongest ratio is observed were infrastructure and construction, Okay, where the bank credit went up by 4.07 times. So there was a four times enlargement of the stock of bank credit over these four years. If you take all other industries put together, it's 2.3 times, and then the, you get the grand total, which is 2.6 times. Okay, This is unfortunately going to matter because it turns out that in the research design that we employ in this paper, we really don't get a lot of infrastructure and construction. So in a way, the work that I'm about to report today is a bit disappointing that we're not getting a statistical methodology to go after infrastructure and construction. So I want to alert you that in a sense, the most exciting stuff in this data is not observable at uh, through the research design that is being reported today. Okay, now the uh, research strategy of this paper is we could look at credit booms from the viewpoint of a country, but that's no fun because there's only one country. We could look at credit booms from the viewpoint of the banks, which is not a lot of fun because uh, good information is not available about uh, individual banks and also because a lot of the hiding of bad news is taking place at the level of banks. So in the official statistics of banks, you don't see a lot of <laughs> the difficulties. So why not jump over the heads of the banks and look at the borrowers? Can we look at financial statements? Can we look at firm performance of the borrowers? So this is a way to see what was happening to the firms. And this links into uh, uh, literature for uh, developing countries and emerging markets where there are arguments running on the other side. The argument being that in a country with a weak financial system, many firms are perennially credit constrained. So maybe in a boom, some firms manage to get capital, they actually manage to grow. So maybe if you can produce some growth, if you can produce some uh, firm performance measures in a credit boom, maybe that's not so bad. So it's interesting to go look at what was happening to the borrowers. 
Okay, so we go after four questions. Was this credit boom a tulip mania? Was there a broad-based euphoria between the borrowers, the banks, the supervisors, and really nonsensical things uh, happened in that period? Uh, question two, what were the characteristics of the firms where the credit surge took place? Uh, question three, did banks behave differently in the credit boom years as compared to a previous set of uh, four years? And uh, finally, and most importantly, if you look a couple of years later, what happened to those firms? What happened to the firms where there was a big surge of credit? Did those firms do well? Did those firms do badly? Okay, so these are the four questions that uh, we seek to address. And we do this using the CMI firm data. So Anushai, we were talking that day. Yeah, so the opportunity is there because a lot of these firms are indeed observed. We define B as the ratio of bank credit in 2008 upon bank credit in 2004. And because we're coming at this as a macro question, we deliberately exclude below median firms. Okay, the idea is, so as, as you would recollect from yesterday's panel discussion, there are some really large borrowers where things have gone bad. And the problems in India on the scale of the banking system, on the scale of the Indian economy, are about very large accounts. So there may be some SME story, but that's not really interesting because it's not big enough to shake the balance sheets of the banks. So we deliberately focus our attention on the larger firms. So what we do is that we start with the banks in 2004, with the borrowers in 2004, and exclude below median bank borrowings. And it turns out to be a pretty small number, it's rupees 46 million. So five crore rupees uh, of bank borrowing is the threshold <coughs> below which we delete firms and we say we're not interested in those firms. And there are 2,500 firms that fit the bill. So there are 2,500 firms in 2004 who have, uh, they're non-financial firms, who have bank borrowing of more than 46 million rupees in 2004, okay? Now, here's the kernel density plot of B, that is the ratio of bank borrowing in 2008 upon 2004. And Right here, I was a little surprised because this is not a generalized bank credit boom. You see the x-axis. This is a B of 5, but this is a B of 0.5. Okay, a B of 0.5 is firms where bank credit in 2008 was half of what it was in 2004. Okay, so if it was a tulip mania where everybody went mad, where all firms were getting huge surges in bank borrowing, you wouldn't have as much probability mass to the left of this distribution, but actually below one, there are a lot of firms. Okay, so a large number of firms actually were holding less bank credit in uh, 2008 than they were in 2004. Okay, so this at least to me came as a surprise because impressionistically when we lived through the years, they were the go-go years where nothing could go wrong. I think it was not the case that there was a generalized euphoria where everybody was uh, borrowing a lot more money. Then we go through uh, OLS regressions, uh, trying to explain B based on firm characteristics. And uh, here you could have two views. One view could be that in the credit boom, banks were reckless, either because they were euphoric or because in any case in India, 80% of bank deposits are public sector banks. Um, and you would think that the wrong kind of firms were getting the credit. And that doesn't really jump out of the results. That's not a fair description of the results. You see that the uh, firms with a big B are actually the firms who in 2004 had better credit characteristics. They had a higher return on capital employed, they had lower debt divided by total assets, they had higher liquidity. So if you look at the OLS regression, they seem quite tame. So through the boom period, the banks seem to have been identifying firms with better credit risk characteristics and sending the credit there. You cannot say that there was really bad decisions being made standing with the information available in 2004 at the beginning of the credit boom. Uh, we go back and look at the period from 2000 to 2004. So we say, what were banks behaving like in their analysis of firm characteristics from 2000 to 2004? And compare that with the same OLS regression for 2004 to 2008. And if anything, in the boom years, the results seem more sane, not less sane. So we're not able to tell a story that something went wrong with the thinking of the banks in the credit boom. The results are remarkably sane. If anything, the banks appear to be more careful and more conservative and more thoughtful in 2004, uh, in the credit boom years as compared to the previous years. So, you know, you could tell a story, it's a business cycle expansion, firms have very good characteristics, but even amongst those firms, there's a selectivity. The banks don't seem to be sending a lot of credit to the wrong places. 
Uh, now we come to the question, mm -hmm. what happened to the firms afterwards? So now you want to look all the way to 2012, 2013. Some firms surged their bank credit. How did they fare? We set up a matching uh, style uh, research design where uh, we identify firms in the top quartile by B. So these are firms with very large increases in bank borrowing and match them against partners with sub below median B. So on one hand, you have a treatment firm with a very high increase in bank credit who's matched against a similar firm with low increase in bank credit, often a bit of a decline in bank credit. Okay, whereas for a whole bunch of observable characteristics, the two firms are alike. Okay, so what you're saying is that there are two firms who are similar. Both of them experience the Lehman shock. Both of them experience the bad times from 2009, 2010. What was the difference in the performance between the firm who took on a lot of bank credit in the credit boom years compared to the firms who did not take on a lot of bank credit in the credit boom years? And we would think that uh, the firms who took on a lot of bank credit would have probably done worse. I want to emphasize, we're not reporting performance in absolute terms, we're reporting the difference in performance between the firms who grew credit dramatically against the firms who did not. And uh, the, we, we do five different research designs because we don't want to believe in the results of any one research design. So it's always healthy to come at the question from many different ways. So we use different matching techniques, we cut the firms in different ways and so on. And uh, it's a very nice matched data set, but it has some flaws. So at the end of the matching procedure, uh, point number one, it, it is beautiful match balance. It's almost like a twin study. So the two groups really line up beautifully. You've got a complete matching of observable characteristics. The trouble is, in the match data set, the largest firm is only 10.85 billion rupees, while there are firms all the way up to 100 times bigger. For the large firms, you don't get matches. Okay, So the internal validity of this work is limited to ru rupees 10.85 billion companies, which is like a thousand crore. We're making statements about lending to thousand crore companies. We're not able to make statements about lending to 10,000 crore companies and 100,000 crore companies. And it turns out that in the match data set, we have very limited representation of infrastructure and construction. There's a little bit of construction. There is essentially no infrastructure, okay? Because you don't get partners. These are younger companies, okay? So it turns out that you don't have the evidence to get a treated firm and a control and compare what was the difference between one and the other. So you want a very good, clean answer. Sorry, we are not able to get that answer. And the main results are remarkably benign, that the firms who took on a very big increase in bank credit in the boom years did not get into a lot of trouble. They, they didn't do very well. But the, this, this work is surprisingly benign, that the firms who took on a lot of bank credit initially grew very fast. Later on, the controls caught up. The profitability is not very different in 2012, 2013. The return on capital employed is not very different in 2012, 2013. So there is no smoking gun in terms of terrible things having come out of uh, the credit boom. So to conclude, we have ex examined the biggest ever credit boom in a quarter century, proposed a novel strategy of looking at the borrowing firms. Uh, this research design has validity for a narrow class. That narrow class is roughly 1,000 crore co rupee companies, 10.85 billion rupee companies, with a low emphasis of infrastructure and construction. And they tend to be older companies because you want to observe them all the way from 2004 to 2012. Within those constraints, I think the machinery of Indian banking and Indian banking regulation worked reasonably well. I don't think you could say that the banks made huge mistakes and the supervisors were deluded in the time of the credit boom. It's worked out reasonably well. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, this is a nice paper. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, India reading it. I must say that I neither I I, I don't have a, neither a comparative nor an absolute advantage in discussing <laughs> a paper about India in this room. So there is a basic question. So it's uh, so, so so credit <laughs> grew a lot over uh, 2004 2008. So 2.6 time total industrial credit as as, as defined by Ajay. But if we look at at uh, one specific uh, area that infrastructure and construction it rose by four times. So it's uh, huge. So it's a very 
the biggest credit boom uh, in, in 25 years. And then, you know, a few years after, we start seeing uh, indication of bank distress. And so the question that the paper asks, is this because of the credit boom? So this is the, the, the growth rate in credit that was already shown, and this is the, the, the increase in bank distress which came afterwards. So, so the paper looks at non-financial corporation that borrow from banks. So there is an initial sample of uh, 14,000 uh, firms, but then at applying some filters, but mostly size, uh, it narrows down the sample to 2,500 firms. And, and the paper has a nice discussion of potential biases with the sample, uh, so this is nice. And, and there are uh, two empirical exercises in the paper. The first empirical exercise is who are the borrowers, so what are the characteristics of this borrower, and this is a OLS regression. And then there is the, the, the second exercise, which is uh, what happened to the borrower after they borrowed. And, and, and this is where um, the, the paper uses uh, matching methods with five different uh, research designs and then uh, a diff in diff specification based on the matching. So this is, uh, so what does the, the, the paper finds that, uh, you know, firms which received a lot of credit are actually better than firms not receive credit. So they did seem that there was this borrowing binge by bad firms. Uh, and there is basically no difference in ex-post firm performance. So again, it's not the case that this guy will get the money uh, wasted and went bad. But uh, given the, the, the methodology, we cannot say much for very large firms, and we cannot say much for the, in a sense, the most interesting sectors, which is, you know, this sector where credit went up a lot and might be the most problematic. So in a sense, the papers say, so we know that there was this huge uh, increase in borrowing. When we look at, sub at a subsample of firms, we don't see much, therefore, Therefore, there is a, a smoking gun that the problem might be in the, in the firms we don't observe. I hope this was a fair summary. So this sort of highlights uh, this problem that, that, that uh, as I mentioned, that we, you know, we have all these guys up here in, uh, in, in infrastructure and in housing, and there are no matches there. So basically, we cannot say anything uh, there. So most of the matching comes down in, in this type of firms. <coughs> So there is a discussion why, um, why, why Ajay prefers matching to OLS for the second part of the experiment. And, uh, and the discussion correctly focuses on nonlinearity and the problem of extrapolating in a simple OLS regression. But somehow, somewhere in the paper, but it's not so clear, uh, you also mentioned identification. Now, if you, so, so does matching allow you to, uh, to establish a causal effect, well, if you want to make a claim of a causal effect, then you also have to discuss that the variables on which you match should be excluded from, you know, are not correlated with the outcome in a sense. So that's something that I saw missing in the paper. Might be really <coughs> good to put it there. And then, and then my my main comment, which is uh, exactly the <laughs> uh, symmetrical to the comment that I made to my paper. So he told me, why don't you matching? And I'm going to ask him, why don't you OLS? <laughs> 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 so and interesting enough, I, th I prepared my discussion without seeing his, and he's prepared my, his discussion without seeing mine. So it was interesting. There was this uh, complete <laughs> symmetry. Uh, so, so why why I, I'm asking? So I'm aware of the problems that they are highlighted in 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 the paper of doing OLS, but I like OLS um, for two reasons. Maybe not as a main specification, but also as to check your result because OLS is very transparent, right? So in, in a, and, and there is something for transparency. So you know, it, OLS is almost like doing a graph, and whatever you get, you get. And then you might argue if I do something different, I get something different, and say so it's better. But if in a sense you get similar results. Results is sort of uh, reassuring. The, the other reason why I think it would be good to, again, also do OLS, I'm not saying not to do matching in, in this thing, because OLS would allow you, with all the limitations of OLS, to study something that you cannot study with matching, that is to be able to say something exactly about the sec sectors you cannot capture with matching. Because if you run a model of this type where you have you know, some uh, performance indicator on the left hand side and then you have your, your B variable which is the credit boom variable 
and then you interact this variable with some measure that capture the sectors in which firm operates you by looking at these parameters by looking at beta and then you control for a bunch of, of, of other things uh, by looking at these parameters you'd be able to say something about this fact this what happens in this industry then might be there is a pro all the problems that you mentioned are fine but if you get something there you say okay you know i know that there are problem met methodology but this goes in the same direction of what my suspicion is so i think it, this would be and this sort of a low hanging fruit you know once you have the data in the computer running this regression will take you 2 minutes uh, so so i would do it and if you get a nice result it would be a sort of a nice complement to what you're saying in the paper if you don't get anything, you can say, you know, because the ORS problem or whatever, but I think it would be interesting uh, to look at it. One measure that I would put as an outcome measure, since exactly you're worrying it about, about bad loans, so there is this measure of distance to default, which is uh, built by Altman, and he has a paper which nobody knows because it's published in some not well-known journal, in which he has this measure uh, how to apply this measure to emerging market countries. So it's this, the same measure of the same standard measure of Altman, but with different weights, which he claims uh, apply well uh, to emerging market countries. So I have the reference. So that would be, again, uh, uh, exactly because you're, you're worrying about problematic loans. So I understand uh, your point why you're, you're dropping small firms, but again, it would be interesting to see what happens when, when you put small firms. This, this point is, really reflects my, my ignorance of what's going on in India, but since India is such a big country, are there regional differences and can you exploit regional differences? So there are segmented you know, financial uh, markets across different cities and regions, so it would be interesting uh, to see uh, something there. And then what you did was beautiful because you presented an empirical paper without showing any table. <laughs> no, no, so it was very nice. But, uh, but in a sense, uh, when you look at the paper, the table that report, report the results of, um, of, of the matching uh, estimation are sort of hard. Well, in a sense, they're easy to read because, as you said, there is nothing is statistically significant. So you look at it and say, you know, all the p-values are, are very high. Um, but it would be nice to see sort of this, this table as a graph, you know, since you have this in different years, how these uh, differences uh, evolve over a year. So, but this is, uh, again, what, uh, what I had to say. I, I, I enjoyed the paper. I think it's very interesting. And I like this idea of sort of looking at the problem from the firm's point of view rather than looking at, at, uh, from the bank's point of view.